Ah, welcome, and thank you so much, Carlos, for the sweet introduction. Um, creating a culture of iconoclasts. I have created a career at Netflix, almost 14 years, ever since we were taken. Remember those silver discs? I don't remember the three letters, but remember those things? Remember we would ship them through the mail and so forth? Well, then were the days when I started at Netflix. And back then, I fancied myself an iconoclast. So I'm going to share with you today, as product leaders across this large room, how you can, too, fancy and create a great career about being an iconoclast, what that means, and we will get to some interesting points. But as product managers, a lot of what you do is prioritize. So to model good behavior, let me tell you what I'm not going to talk about. An iconoclast, I'm not going to talk about Moses coming down from a mountain and his brother Aaron was screwing around with a golden calf and suddenly he goes, no, you can't worship the calf, you got to worship something above that. Or I'm not going to talk about Pope Leo IV who said, no, 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 you don't worship crucifixes and crosses, you worship the Lord. No, no, not going to talk about that, skip that. Never said any of that. I'm going to bring iconoclasm into the modern age. I am going to channel the soul of Titus and Dramadon. I'm going to talk about how I don't care if you channel your inner Beyonce like he's doing, just you want to challenge convention. And certainly, that's what this guy does. And we'll talk about the importance of that. We'll talk about the importance of that around innovation. Because in the end, what is innovation but creating something that challenges the status quo? The whole time it's been done this way, and consumers, whoever's using whatever product you're creating it, they're doing it this way, and you go, you know what? Maybe, let me do something crazy. Let me make my life and the life of the world a little more interesting. Let me try doing it this way. And that's what really you want to think about. How do you break the mold? How do you do something a little different? How do you spice it up? So here's some fun. If you've never heard of this guy, his name is Ai Weiwei. We had a documentary about him on Netflix. And basically, those photos, those black and white photos, that's part of his art. And what I like about this guy is he will flip the middle finger to the White House, Tiananmen Square. He will smash any idol that gets in his way. Now, if this guy, this guy's served under house arrest, the Chinese government before, but he's become so famous around the world that he's become somewhat immune to that, and he just challenges whatever's in front of him to create great art. But we're not here as product leaders to create great art. We're here to create great products. Sometimes they're artful. So, these two guys, what do we, what do we think? Iconoclast, Thomas Edison, Steve Jobs, did they challenge the way very much how product was done around the world? Absolutely. Did they fly in the face of a lot of conventional wisdom? Sure, of course they did. Were they great iconoclasts? Sure, we'll go with that. And, and they were played by some of the top actors of their day. Spencer Tracy, he played Thomas Edison. Michael Fassbender, he did a fine job playing Steve Jobs. So should we worship on our knees before Edison or before Jobs? I would say absolutely not, because that's not in the spirit we're in. Because do you want to model your behavior after them? You think these were sweetheart of guys? Do you think they really, really did everything they claimed to do? Or do you think they had great people working underneath them and they just took a hell of a lot of the credit? Do you think they bullied people underneath them? Yeah, I think a little bit, just a little bit. <laughs> so they rode coattails of many geniuses. I'm not saying they're not geniuses in their own right. I'm not saying they're, own, they're not iconoclasts. But you know what? To be really blunt, and since I'm ending the day to keep everyone awake, here's a little secret. You can be an iconoclast and not be an asshole. I'm just saying. I'm just saying that. I'm just throwing it out there. So I'm going to take you through a career of being an iconoclast. And let's start with step one. So if you look underneath your chair, you're going to find either a baseball bat or a sledgehammer. I'll give you a moment. Okay. I don't mean literally. I mean figuratively. So take you through a little journey, a mirror of what I've done in my career step by step. And I promise, do not genuflect upon any of this. The way I want you to look at this is just an example of a career with iconoclasm of challenging things. So when I got to Netflix, January 2006, 
We were on our knees and we were praying to what was above us, the stars. And so you'd think Netflix, which is legendary, to be a data-driven company. How can we be so religious to pray underneath the stars? Well, it wasn't these stars, it was these stars. It was the five stars you rate titles on. And those five stars you rate titles on, that was like everything. We thought, the key here, remember, those were the days of those silver discs. And back in the days of the silver discs, if you wanted, there was like 100,000 titles. And so if you want the right thing added to, here's an old-fashioned word, your cue, to be shipped to you, basically we thought the magic was in getting them to rate. And my job, the first job I had at Netflix was, I was like the Terminator. I had one mission, and my mission was get people to rate as many titles as possible on a five-star scale. And you give a product manager a clear metric, and you give them a mission, and they grab onto that pants cuff, and they will not let go. And they fought, and they're driving it, and they're seeing that metric. Get out of my way. I was going to get as many people to rate on five stars as possible because... If we can get people to rate on five stars, then we'll understand their taste. And we'll understand, are they more about Schindler's List or more about Napoleon Dynamite? What do they really like? And so we got millions of ratings, then tens of millions. Then literally, by the time it was over, we got over 50% of the Netflix base to rate at least 50 movies. It ended up to be billions of ratings. All right. So then... Was it worth it? So you can go after a metric, you can fight, you can try to improve your business. And I was like, I've been working this, I've been doing this, but really? Or is it pointless? What the hell am I doing? So I found my figurative baseball bat and I challenged it. And I said, does it really matter? And we did something all those years ago called the Netflix Prize. And we tried to get the best possible algorithm to use all those billions of ratings. And we open sourced it, we threw it out to the community and we'd give them a million dollars if they can give a better algorithm, 10% more accurate than the existing Netflix algorithm for personalization. And after some time, a year or two, a combination of teams from around the world actually won that prize. And that gave me a perfect opportunity to create a wonderful A-B test. And I love the speech before me, but tell you what, A-B testing isn't about like and we want to give everyone the best experience. Uh-uh. You don't know if it's the best experience. You're trying. You come up with a hypothesis thinking that's the best thing to give to my users. But you don't know until you A-B test it. So why give it to everyone until you know this thing works and then expand it out? So we took the better algorithm driven by that community million dollar prize thing. And that was 10% better. And we took the existing algorithm, and I wanted to see, does it really drive a better customer experience? And as a subscription service, there's one metric you really care about that's going to put bread on your table as an employee. Thank you. Retention. So if we had the better algorithm compared to the one that was driven by all those billions of star ratings, and you know what the results look like? They were flat as the plains of Kansas. There was nothing. <laughs> I was like, okay, all right, that was it. Because in the end, I thought, it's not about what people say they like. They might say, oh, of course, five stars to Schindler's List, to Hotel Rwanda, to The Inconvenient Truth. And one star to uh, Paul Blart Mall Cop. But that was a big title back in the day. If you haven't seen it, you might want to leave it that way. But um, <laughs> in, in the end, they were really watching a lot more Paul Blart Mall Cop. So, you know what? Better than what they say they like is what their behavior, what they're actually getting shipped and watching, or in this day and age, what they're clicking play and streaming. It's helpful to get explicit information, but behavioral information much more powerful. And thus, I drove the company and the product in that direction. That's step one. Step two is innovate, challenge, but in the end, don't do it yourself. Enlist others to run with your idea who could even take their brains and double down on your idea and are smarter than you and can run even faster. So I'll give you an example of that. I'll keep it clean, I promise. So this drove me crazy. 
This was back in the day before Netflix was doing those Netflix branded original content. We were all licensed content. And we had a nice deal with the Cartoon Network. And particularly, we were getting their catalog of Adult Swim. If you don't watch that, that's the late night kind of Cartoon Network content. Really niche-like, really edgy animation for adults. And so back then, how it would work is we'd license some content, and then whatever the studio was that we were licensing from, they'd give us the artwork. And so what did the Cartoon Network give us for all the Adult Swim titles? I swear to God, I'm not making it up. It looked like that. They were literally, it was like, well, what are they, like, remember Ai Weiwei with throwing the finger? That's like, what are they doing that to us? We're paying them good money for these titles. They were giving us black artwork with just this plain white font listing the title. And I, so I went to one of the content buyers. I was up in Silicon Valley. She was down here in L.A. And I said, she was the one controlling this deal. I go, what's, what's up, Elizabeth? Why are they sending us this? And she said, I question. I asked just like you asked me to, Todd. And what they said was, our brand on Adult Swim is so strong that all they have to do is see that little Adult Swim logo. And the look of our brand is that black with white on top. And they will be clicking play and they love it. And I love when companies are self-delusional about their brand. <laughs> because the truth of it is that <laughs> they weren't getting played very much. I wanted to know what the heck it was, Aqua Teen, Hunger Force. I know some fans out there, I don't know this content. I, I do love Rick and Morty, they did the better stuff later. Robot Chicken, the Venture Brothers. So they were doing these shows, I wanted to know what they looked like. So I go, Elizabeth, please can you get better artwork? She couldn't get it. And then finally I said, Elizabeth, and they don't sometimes want to put me outward facing at Netflix. They want to leave me in a box doing my product stuff. But I go, let me talk to these executives. She said, okay, fine. So I get them in the phone and I go, I have an idea, guys. It's better for you if we can drive more viewing on your content. And it's better for us because it's better for you if we get more viewing and more hours you know what? When the deal runs out, we'll give you even more money. So I said, just give us better artwork, please. No, 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 no. This is for our brand. This is for our brand. I go, I got an idea. How about if we take an image from the title and we A-B test it? And back then, remember, this is like six, seven years ago. And it's like A-B testing. What is that? So I explained it. That didn't work. They didn't know what I was talking about. <laughs> then I explained it again in a different way. And then I was pulling out every metaphor I could think of. And I was trying to like, I was so, trying so hard. After the longest time on the phone, they agreed to it. I don't know if they actually got A-B testing or they were just like exhausted by me keep on going on and on and on. So I filibustered my way to an A-B test. <laughs> and we tried different images. So what we agreed with is we were going to use this black art. We were also, we were going to pick an image, they were going to pick an image, and we were going to randomly throw it out, you know, hundreds of thousands get this one, hundreds of thousands this one, triple blind test, let's see how it plays out. It's no shock. This was like the lowest bar I ever had to be tested against. This is the most confident I've ever been. It's like the fix was in, like I had the ace underneath the table. So, yes. By using the art we picked, they tried to still keep that brand look with the same font and the Adult Swim. We screwed up with the title treatment, and we used different art. And you can see from those metrics, just their art, using really an image from the show, drove the title by like over 50% more streaming. That's millions of hours. And so we tried it on a bunch of titles, and the data was really consistent. And so the Cartoon Network... Let's have angelic trumpets. Do we have sound effects here? No. Um, they saw the light. They, they got the idea that this was better, and thus we ended up re renewing our deal, and it was all happily ever after. That is all good. But now I saw something bigger, and this is where I began smashing the idol myself, but then handed it over to smarter people. And so part of the team, I said, you know, why don't you run with this, and why should we just do this for Cartoon Network? Why don't we test every image? Why don't we try it all across the board? So now, great people on my team are testing images all across Netflix. Now we personalize it, and every title gets artwork in 10, 15 different ways that each individual can get different art. Now we're starting to do with video promotion and trailers and so forth. So this became a big thing. So this was, I began the process, flipped the bat to very capable colleagues, and they ran with it. And this has gone, been a huge innovation for Netflix. Step three 
empower others to smash. As your career rises up, you have a lot going on, and now the ideas you start hearing from your team because you created a culture of iconoclast, and they're thinking, what can we change? How can we do something better? How can we do something more effectively? So, I used to work for a wonderfully smart gentleman named Neil Hunt. He was in Netflix for maybe 20 years, worked for Neil for many years. And Neil said, 2016, Neil said to the media, he goes, there is no way Netflix is ever going to do downloads. That would be a waste of time because Neil has a strong vision. And in Neil's vision, it's that the internet is going to be ubiquitous wherever you are in any single place, you'll be able to pick up the internet. So why download and be offline when we'll be constantly, wherever we go, always online? So he felt like it was a waste of time. That was in the spring of 2016. Three or four months later, someone on my consumer insights team at Netflix came up to me and go, Todd, I am convinced that downloading is important because we just launched in Southeast Asia and India a few months ago. And those countries, their internet is so choppy and so inconsistent, this can be really important for Netflix. And even in Western Europe and the U.S. and South Korea and places that have better internet, it will still be used by maybe a smaller percent of people, but it'll be a useful feature. And he did some surveys, and he came to me with compelling data, and I thought, that's a good innovation. We should do downloads. So then I threw my weight on this, and I supported him, and he had as much tailwind as I could provide, and after much debate, give him a lot of credit, we drove this through, team picked up on it, and it's a, it's a really essential feature for us now in those places, like Brazil and India, where the internet isn't as great, and people are using downloading a lot. In the U.S., maybe it's used by 10% of consumers on a monthly basis. In those countries, it's used by the majority. Very important, so that's that step. Now, well, I don't remember that slide. This is going to be magical. Let's, let's see what I can do with this one. Stick, <laughs> stick with me. Uh, I'm, I'm really screwing around now. <laughs> so, um, step four. <laughs> step four is when you let them take their bat and their sledgehammer to you. Now, suddenly, you start receding into the background. As a good leader, you start empowering your team. And to empower your team, they should be disrupting your ideas. Because suddenly, you become the fossil, the person who's at the company 13, 14 years, who they wheel out for an occasional presentation, they lock back in the broom closet. <laughs> the ideas now start coming from the team. And so now you have to have built up enough self-esteem to go, let them challenge you. Let them come up with ideas that will, so because we'll try things, because we don't want that one, the legendary Steve Jobs, the great Thomas Alva Edison, because all the ideas came out of their brain, right? Wrong. And so you want to pull the brain from, you want to use everyone on the team and get the best ideas you can. So... This was a year, maybe a year and a half ago. One of the PMs we had, he was pretty new at Netflix. He had come from Amazon. And Amazon has a tradition of, you probably heard this before, at least many of you have, they write the press release before they even write a spec for the product. So they write this whole press release because the idea behind it is they, it almost like leans into success. What will this look like? What will everyone be saying about how great this product is for consumers, for whomever? So he did that because he was fresh from Amazon, and I'm open to it. We are not bound to any particular process. And if he wants to use some Amazonian witch doctor powers for me, go ahead and do that. So he brought in, and he showed me this press release. And the press release, this was it, and he showed me is, we are going to do a new plan in India, and it's going to be a mobile-only plan, and it's going to be less than half the price of our lowest tier. And I was like, all right, let me explain why I don't think this is a good idea. And I was very patient and quite patronizing. I hope I wasn't. I don't think I was. But I was, I was patient. And I was saying, this is why I don't think. It's going to bring down our ASP. It's going to bring down our average price so much that all the subscribers you're going to get and everyone else is going to downgrade from the highest plans. So we're just in the end. It's going to be revenue negative. Maybe we'll get more people subscribing at this much cheaper plan, but it's going to hurt the business and the bigger picture. So I thought, bad idea, but he was passionate. And the two things that I love most, the two qualities 
that I want out of any product leader on my team are passion and logic combined. And if he was passionate and he was logical, he was convinced this was going to work, okay, and then he laid out why, and I was poking, and I was, you know, I wasn't confident, but I also knew, I don't know, a lot of this is guesswork. And so now he gave me the case of why he thought this would work, and we tested it. And you know what's going to happen now? It was successful. And now there's a mobile-only plan in India, and we're going to try in a couple of other countries, developing countries, and it was big. And yeah, a lot of people did migrate to the lower plan, but it opened up the floodgates of how many people were joining Netflix and are joining Netflix, because this was only a few months ago when we actually launched it. So that worked. So consider me a smashed idol now, and that is a good place to be as a leader. And I'm actually more proud of that than when I was smashing idols. Why? Because I'm one person, whereas my team, much more leverage. I hire really smart people who are willing to smash idols. We can do better as a company. So few kinds of things that I think are important to a culture to create a culture of iconoclasts. Set the table for dissent. Be open to it. Welcome it. Compliment it. Even if you disagree, thank people for their ideas when they don't agree with you. And politely disagreeing, that's a great place to be and a lot of good things to hear. Push decision making down. It's not like I told this PM, I'm deciding this is a bad idea. We're killing it here. It was more like, you're in charge of pricing and plans for India. You want to try it, go ahead. I'm skeptical, but I'm also curious and hope it works. Yes, I can be a loud voice, but I don't want to control the conversation. I want to hear the voices of the team. I want to hear the voices of people in the company. And so it's important to create forums, and some people communicate in different ways. Some people love this game. Jeopardy. What's the key of Jeopardy? Well, just recent articles have come out with that guy, I forgot his name, who made that fortune of money. Not only did he know trivia, but even more importantly, he mastered how to hit the trigger, the button, to buzz in first before anyone else. And you totally know this from meetings in some environment. I, we used to be like this at Netflix years ago. We're not anymore, which is good. You're in a meeting, you're in a table, and there's a bunch of people here, and some people have the ability to know exactly when the person who's speaking is up to their very last syllable of their last word. And then, bam, they hit the buzzer. And then they get in their word, and then it's their turn, and they grab the floor. And you know what? Some of us are good at it. Some of us aren't. But you know, just because you're good at that silly skill, it doesn't mean you have the best ideas. It doesn't mean you're the only voice. It doesn't mean there aren't other good ideas. It just means you're really fast on the buzzer. And that's not a good way to be. So now, sometimes it's good to just, you know, why don't we raise our hands? Make sure everyone... No, it doesn't feel juvenile. It seems more orderly. So you hear more voices in the room. So that's what we want. We want the diverse set of voices in the room. We don't only want people who are loud and good at Jeopardy. We don't want the most senior person in the room. We want to hear from people. And we want to hear their ideas. And I want to hear their passion and their logic. And so some people, they don't want to speak up in a room. As product leaders, communication is one of the most important parts of your job. And some people are better at written communication than verbal communication. And that's okay. We've become at Netflix over the years a Google Docs culture. Memos are put out there and people are commenting. And if you're better commenting by writing it down, that's great. We want to open up these things. We want to open up as many channels. And I'm not just talking about PMs. I'm talking about engineers and designers and content partners and marketing partners and everyone across the board. And don't just accept dissent. Farm for dissent. Push people. Anyone disagree? And really, and if they know you're not just saying that symbolically, but you really want to be, you want people to punch holes in your idea because you want it to be successful at the end and you want to bet on the right things. And yes, I am a strong advocate. You can't always A-B test, but when you can, the metrics will tell you the story. And that's a great arbiter, and it's a great democratization of product. Because then it suddenly doesn't become, my gut, my instinct says, that's the right idea. It's more like, you know what? You really believe in that? Let's add a test cell to that. Let's try out your idea. Let's see if it works. And you'll be surprised. Sometimes, you know what? Your instinct is just dead wrong. So sometimes, 
I have a new part of my career at Netflix. For years, I've been the consumer-facing guy, and I still am, and my team is, and a big part of my team is. But six months ago, I took over the product side on the studio-facing side of Netflix. You see, Netflix, we are now producing an unprecedented number of movies and TV shows around the world. And basically, Hollywood is still lost in the 20th century and not the 20th, and they haven't entered into the 21st century. And technology can do a lot on how you make movies and TV shows to make them more efficient and productive, all the way from when you pitch a project to when you hit play on Netflix. And so we're building all these amazing apps around, you know, across the whole ecosystem. And there's a lot of work, and we're in early days, but it's really hard to measure when you're building this app for the legal team or the finance team or you're building it for production coordinators and, product, you know, and line producers on a set. And so when you're doing something like that, you can't A-B test. So you have to come up with other ways, and we're trying to figure out other ways you can measure to create that vision and to use leverage metrics to find your vision. So you can't always A-B test, but still farm for descent, look for iconoclasts, really look for how do we innovate. Last slide. It's been a long day for everyone, even though I only got here an hour ago, but it's been a long day for everyone. <laughs> and so if you're going to learn one thing from today, at least in my presentation, because I didn't see the other ones, I'm sure there's lots of great stuff. But if you're going to take away one image from anything I said, ponder that. Because that's a slide I've been showing internally at Netflix for years. And that is the most important position you could be in as a product leader. Why is that? Because you should lean so far forward that sometimes you fall on your face. And that's okay. Because if you're doing that, that means you're pushing it. That means you're being an iconoclast. That means you're a challenger and you're trying ideas. So when someone on my team is like that, you stand up, you brush yourself off. That is a good thing, and I like that. And with that... I'm going to end on this note, which is I have two teenagers, 113 and 115. And how do you know if you've created a culture of iconic, iconoclasts? It's not just because your kids will do nothing that you say whatsoever all day and night, but that is true. It's when the tables have turned, not only at home, but at work. And like I said, when they turn the bat on you and they're challenging things, that could be exhausting as a manager of PMs, but I know that's a good thing because I know I've done the right thing. And if we're debateful and respectful, we've created the right culture that will be fertile and really keep on making us great innovators in entertainment for years to come. I am out of words. Thank you very much.